Hello, everybody. It's I'm Tanya Davidson, the director and well, and the creator of the Jewelry Makers Guild and a fellow maker of 25 years. It's my quest to learn as much as I can, try as many materials and techniques as possible, and then to share those with other artists um, through either the, the Facebook group, YouTube, or my Instagram page. So I thought it would be fun to do a visual podcast because I'm not a very good auditory learner, so visual is where it's at. So a visual podcast showing slides and the maker so that you can find out what makes them so interesting and their work so incredible. If you're watching this on YouTube, which I love, thank you, please um, smash the like button and subscribe so that you'll continue to see this um, information and future podcasts and so others will be able to see it as well. And if you've missed any of the past 12 podcasts, they're all there for you to listen to or watch as often as you like and as many times. And if you would be so kind as to leave a comment on any of those videos, I would greatly appreciate it. And I know the artists, they give their time to come and talk to you and to uh, give you a little bit of information about their work and their inspiration and they would love to hear from you as well. So that would be a great place for you to leave a comment. So please help me welcome to my podcast today, Teresa Kiplinger. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Tanya. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, it's I'm so <laughs> lucky to have you today. So for, I am so honored to be here. Thank you. So for <laughs> those of you who don't know Teresa, let me um, introduce her. She is a studio jeweler, a poet, and a noted graphic designer. She's also a business owner, which is fascinating too. She combines precious metals, humble alloys, enameled images, and original verse to create haunting and expressive art jewelry. Inspired by personal narratives, ephemera, ephemera I can never say that word, and I practiced it like a hundred times before this call, <laughs> and loss, her modern memento mori work calls us to consider the fragility of our existence, which I think we've all done this past year. Her evocative work was selected for the snag as good as gold exhibition, the enamel guild Northeast under fire three exhibition and has appeared in Bellamar jewelry magazine, winter 2018, autumn 2020, and winter 2020 issues. She was recently chosen for inclusion in Linda Kozloff Turner's forthcoming book, A Hundred Women in Jewelry, which I cannot wait to get. Teresa has a BFA in graphic design from Kent State University, 1992. That's when I graduated. In 2004, she co-founded Form, a creative services firm for nonprofits where she continues to serve as partner and creative director. That's her nine to five. So I can't believe someone posted a, a comment that she's very prolific. I can't believe how much work she gets done and she has a nine to five job also. She works out of her studio in Cleveland, Ohio, and in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you'll find Teresa's website and her social media pages, so please make sure and check those out, follow her, and as you know on social media, it really helps when you like, comment, and save every post so that Instagram notices and shows those pictures and those things to other people. So thank you for joining me today, Teresa. It's so great to have you here. As we talk, um, I'm gonna be showing slides of your work on the screen, and if at any time you wanna stop me to say something about the work or what inspired you, please do that because you know, even if we're talking about something else that's really important, people want to know about your work and they want to know things about what we're showing. So please stop me because sometimes it's hard for me to know which slide to show, which part of our conversation. So sometimes they're out of order. So let's dig in. So for almost all of us, there was uh, something that sparked the creative drive that we, when we were little or a teenager or in college, we might have been on a different path and something or someone um, kind of showed us that spark in us. And that's when we decided to make art. So I'm curious about who or what was your earliest memory of making jewelry and going in that direction? Well, um, my, well, these pictures here, I'll just speak to that. I, I grew up in rural Ohio where there wasn't a ton to do. And um, so I often would um, tell my mom I was bored and looking for something to do. And um, she always would just arrive at the kitchen table with a hunk of clay or a bar of soap for me to carve 
or oil paints in an easel and say, okay, you know, get to work. Um, and she's an artist too. And so she was often working on her own work right, right beside me. And, and that is really how I, I grew up. And I always preferred to spend my time making. I was not a kid that did sports or any of that stuff. I just wanted to be making. Uh, so she really encouraged every little artistic whim that I had. And she gave me the tools to explore different materials. And, and um, that led me to a really creative life. And that, that's been a real gift. So, um, so really, my mom was, was, I think, the biggest influence in my early life, for sure. That's awesome. My mom was the same way. She was an artist, too. And um, she was actually a textile artist. So mm -hmm. I, she, I thought she was, she, she just would bug me all the time. She's like, um, come pick out these colors for this. She would show me your design. Like, I gave two hoots about her design. I was just like, why are you bothering me? And I'd say, well, how about <laughs> that color, that color, and that color? Because she was terrible picking colors. So she would just go with whatever I said. And I never really understood until I was much older that whole, what was happening. And then I thought, well, why wasn't mm -hmm. I getting a cut of, <laughs> of all of that? <laughs> but it was, it's really. You had, it, had it on the payroll. Yeah. It's so great to have that, sh that when you share that with a um, parent, you know, a lot of people talk about their father and their shops and watching them. And so I, I love that she would just, you know, instead of saying, go watch TV or whatever, she could hand you a block of clay and say, you know, make something out of this. I think that's really beautiful. And we don't often do that enough with our children anymore because of electronics, you know? Yeah, I think that that's completely true. I mean, I was growing up in the late 70s and 80s and, um, you know, this stuff, all this stu electronic stuff didn't exist then. But, and my dad also was a mechanical tinkerer and he had a giant garage full of all kinds of tools and he made his own like pneumatic presses and stuff. Wow. And, and I was afraid of those tools growing up. I was kind Me of too. a girly girl about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, he died when I was young and I, I have a lot of his tools now and I often think how proud he would be of me no longer afraid of the tools and some crazy tools and crazy chemicals, you know? Yeah nitric acid and acetylene and yeah you know, so i i love thinking that he would be proud of me for that i love that well you know they're i think they're always with us their energy is around us they're they're part of uh, us all the time and um yeah i t I, I that brings me back to my parents so i won't go there but anyway <laughs> so the next question is sort of in line with that um it's a two-part question I believe that all of our experiences, our travel, the people that we've been around, our ups and downs. You talked about your losses in your, in your intro. Um, the pe you know the people we choose to spend our time with. It's so precious, and even the animals, your fur baby, that we spend time with. They all shape who we are and and our work, and it comes out like through our pores um, and, and envelops what we're working on, whether. Um, it's, we, we think about it or not, it becomes part of that. So who or what helped shape your work? Um, and do you, and right now, what do you think? Do you think there's something that currently helps shape your work as you move forward with your new, with each store, with each collection or technique that you try? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the things that influenced me most that I, it's weird because I, I've been a graphic designer for 30 years and, you know, in graphic design, it, it is the antithesis of emotion. Like what you're trying to do is, you know, it's a whole other art form. You know, it's not even an art form. It's a, almost a skill or science. And, um, but when I was growing up, I was very sensitive and emotional and um, I liked exploring um all the ephemera in my grandma's house we grew up next to her farm and she just had bookcases jammed with weird old relics of dead ancestors like she had a stack of funeral cards from the victorian era and if anybody's not familiar with those they're they're black five by seven cards with a photo of the dead person and a little cutout and they're usually embellished with gold text and flowers and birds and things, which, by the way, is was the impetus for my entire color palette and still is like that's where I pull, draw my color palette from is those funeral cards. Um, but, you know, those things were so like serious. They were so serious for a seven year old to be leafing through these 
you know, death records and funeral cards and like the braid of a dead great, great, great aunt in a shoebox. Like these are just the things that were in my grandma's house. And because I was kind of a serious kid, that stuff just really left an imprint on me. I think what was interesting to me was that these fragments were were parts of people's lives and now all that's left of their lives are these little pocket notebooks and ledgers and yeah. you know, postcards and trinkets. And and um that bothered me and intrigued me even then. Um so, and then she also had a collection of 19th century poetry books, which I think you sh showed a slide a couple slides ago of those books. I have the books now. Um, that one? Yeah, this, this one. And so she had these amazing poetry books that were filled with these dramatic engravings um, of like ghosts in churchyards and shipwrecks and you know, the one in the foreground, I stared at this so much when I was a kid. And that that image in the foreground is a a man kneeling at a grave, you know, and it's like I'm seven and I'm fascinated by these images <laughs> because I was it, this was the 70s and the 80s. It was all like purple sparkly cars and neon and MTV. And this just felt more like my old soul. Mm -hmm. And so I preferred these things like I remember carrying around these old books in my book bag in high school just to have them near me because it made me feel better yeah um so so all of that stuff really influenced me and then those books influenced me to start writing poetry which is what you would see in that previous slide um that's one of my binders of poems so i have many of those binders of poems that i've been keeping for yeah here for for a very long time um and then that image there on the right is my dad. Um, I lost him when I was 20 and he was only 44. I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but um, all of those things really influenced my, my aesthetic when I came back around to an art form after 30 years in graphic design. I came around to an art form being metals that is purely expressive. I kind of had to scrub the 30 years of I serve a client and I solve someone else's problem at their behest to I'm expressing myself and making something mm -hmm. because graphic design really, really aims to take that out of you. Um, if you're good at it, it shouldn't influence you. Your, your feelings are not right. part of it. You're solving someone's problem. So, um, uh, and this is one of my illustrations, by the way, of that 30 years of of graphic design work that I did. This is a scratchboard illustration. Um, and I'm showing that because I think people who know my work can probably see a little bit of influence mm -hmm. uh, in, in from that um, illustration, years of your illustration. Um, and then this image on the left there, that is uh, my stepson, Adam, who also died very young. And I will also talk about that um, a little bit later. But um, all of this stuff, you can see it's sort of, um, I know sometimes you call it a stew, Tanya. This is what my stew looks like. There's <laughs> a lot of a lot of stuff in it. It's like a really good goulash. <laughs> I used to ask is, yeah. my grandma, what's in there? And she said, oh, just stuff that I want to put in just there. Just stuff. Just stuff. Yeah. But, but, you know, I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to, when I moved into metals, I tried really hard to separate my graphic design roots out of my work. And when I finally realized, oh, no, they can come together, mm -hmm. that is when I really started to find my voice. So I, it was a challenge for me to combine the expressive, emotive, poetic part of what I wanted to do with my metalwork and those graphic design principles. Um, but I, I finally got it sort of working. So, um, but I think that that's part of what makes my aesthetic what it is, is like kind of all those influences. It's kind of old, it's kind of graphical, it's kind of clean, it's kind of messy, um, it's kind of poetic, it's kind of not, um, so. Well, they, each one definitely tells a story, and uh, it combines all of those things so beautifully. I, I, I don't know that I would know that you were a graphic designer, because I don't see the, the structure, and I know I have to get away from that in my work, too, because one of my degrees is in interior design, but it's more like interior architecture, so it was sitting mm -hmm. at a drawing board, you know, at a drafting table, and everything was straight lines of different uh, heft and weight 
And then to go and just be freer, like I'm always telling myself, you just need to let go, be freer, you know, but it's really hard when that's part of your training and what you're, you're normally doing with your work. So it is, well, I mean, the fact that this is like in a little symmetrical frame and, you know, the decision about the shape of that veil being, you know, it's not flowery, it's kind of minimal, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of distressed stuff going on in this piece that you would never like us I, I came through a swiss school of design and the swiss school is very like everything is helvetica and everything is on a grid and everything is clean and there's a lot of white space and i i some of that you know pours into my work like this piece is a memorial piece for my dad and that is about as emotional a piece as i can make right like that is really coming from a core place in me. It took me a long time to be able to even make this piece because I still grieve that loss 30 years later. Um, but talking about Swiss design, look at that entire chunk of negative space to the left of, of the figure. That's my design training, you know, coming mm -hmm. in yeah. that choice to leave that. And actually there was someone else in that image to the left, this is a decal, this is a torch fire decal. And there was another person standing next to him. So I airbrushed that guy out. And then I elongated the shadow to make it a little more surreal. And then I printed it into a decal and fired it. So um, all those little decisions, I think, come from my design background. They do. And knowing how to use space to make someone feel uncomfortable or comfortable is also a skill you know it's something you can learn and but it's also it's it, it's something you have to work at too you know or learning to edit like um your design skills are really good at, at knowing when to edit something and when to include something it's it's remarkable it's, your work is beautiful but i won't slobber all over you <laughs> yet <laughs> well, that's really kind of you to say but i you know i feel like i tor i torture over every one of these decisions, sometimes I just get paralyzed. And I'm sure a lot of people, I know people talk about this all the time. I just get paralyzed with one of these pieces. This piece sat in, in parts on my bench for a good three months before I would just commit to what I was trying to do with it. But it was a very significant cathartic piece for me. It was important, an important piece for me to make personally. So I just wanted it to present itself to me what it wanted mm -hmm. to be. And so I just had to when it wasn't coming, I just had to set it aside and, and keep returning to it. You know, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, so my next question along these same lines is I, I do believe that art, the best art is made by someone who's communicating something, whether that's an energy or a story or an, they have an underlying need to communicate that experience and to leave that mark with that piece. So I know that's kind of artsy and heavy but and sometimes it's nice like yesterday I said I just want to make a pair of pretty earrings I don't want to think about what it means and it ended up meaning something anyway but you know sometimes <laughs> it's just a burden to have to like think about what everything what the purpose is of it but anyway so what do you think you're trying to communicate through your art if you could sum it up or put it into a pithy thought that we could grab onto and sort of take run with it Hmm. Pithy, I don't have. Ah, oh, that's tough for me. I get a little poetic and deep and somber, but pithy, maybe not. I'll try. <laughs> um, so I refer to my work as modern memento mori. Um, that's kind of where I am now and in, in what, where I'm going and what I'm trying to do. And by that, I mean, I intend for it to prompt us to consider the brevity of our existence. And um, I want this work to be kind of an ever present reminder of the fragility of life. Um, and this theme, I mean, this isn't what I set out to do. It's what my work became. And then I looked back and realized that's, that's what I do. It took me a couple of years to figure that out. But um, this, this theme though, I know was born out of two profound losses in, in my life, two lives that were cut short. Um, the first one was I mentioned earlier was my dad. 
1989, he, he died at age 44 when I was 20. And he had a devastating disease that caused him to suffer a lot. And I bore witness to that suffering and being young and kind of in, I was in college and I was just, you know, dad can't die. And um, I think a lot of us, you know, feel that way about our dads. And so losing him, I just suddenly understood the fragility of life and it, it really profoundly changed who I am as a, as a person, that experience um, forever. It just totally changed me. And, um, and so that was in 1989 and I grieved that loss for many, many years. And as I said, I still do. And then in 2015, my stepson, Adam, uh, took his own life just a couple of days after he turned 18. And um, at that time, I had just been getting serious about my metal work. Um, and I had just decided to start dedicating literally like every Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to get into that studio and start really accelerating my skills. So when he died, it was kind of this convergence of overwhelming grief and burgeoning metal skills. And um, I didn't know what to do with all that grief. So I just poured it in to my work in my studio. Uh, I created a, a piece in his honor. And uh, that piece really led me to my voice. So th those, I feel those two losses in every piece that I make in some way or another. Mm -hmm. There is a, a pain underneath all of this. And it's therapeutic for me really to be putting it out there because it, it's just kind of how I, I process that, that pain and loss. So those are the, the biggest, I think those are the things that led me to, to my voice and these themes that I follow in my work. It's, um, loss is a really awful thing. I I've lost both my parents. They were you know, what I thought was pretty young, 68 and 70 of both horrible, rare cancers. And I, I don't know how, but I feel like at least my mother's death was a huge gift to me. And mm -hmm. I was on a path that probably wasn't very healthy or sane or, um, and detrimental to other people around me. And it really, it stopped me in my tracks and um, I wasn't also creating at the time. So I don't know how it happens, but I think sometimes death can be a gift, a blessing and in a weird way. And I know that sounds strange, but without your voice and the way that you affect other people, we wouldn't maybe have that if you hadn't gone through those experiences, which is not to lessen those experiences or say, you know, um, shorten them but to say yeah. we need to look at everything i think in what can we get out of it that's a good thing that you know uh -huh. so anyway yeah, well adam adam was a very creative young young man very very talented and um and that was our little project it's funny i kind of forgot about this but you know i mentioned my mom and i uh, how we spent our Saturdays, Adam and I spent our Saturdays in the same way. We drew and we painted and we sculpted. <laughs> um, I never really, really realized the parallel until just now, um, but I was doing with him what my mom had done with me. Um, and, you know, I I have said many times that I feel my my work accelerated significantly in 2015 after he died. and And it took me into this very healing place and i sure i'm sure a lot of metalsmiths turn to their bench for healing yes um but but you know i i credit him with that not that he died but that i feel he gave me that after he died like i felt his presence lifting me up into this creative space that i always had wanted to be in so i i think that was his final gift to me yes yeah, they don't ever leave us. They're always with us. Mm -hmm. So as you make these amazing pieces that are so meaningful, is it difficult for you to part with them? Is the journey 
more do, of the piece hold more importance for you? Or, and once you're done with the journey, it's okay to let go of it? Or do you have a hard time letting go of the pieces that you create? And, and can you speak a little bit about that drive? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's all about letting it go. It is all about it being in someone else's hands. Um, my work is, I was just telling this to someone earlier today. I feel like my my work and, and sending it out into the world is kind of like shedding a tear or like a bloodletting. It's like this thing <laughs> has come out of me and now it's going away. And I, you know, it's it's not meant to be with me anymore. So, you know, I've expressed what I needed to express in this piece and, and knowing that it's being received and felt really is the point. For me, it's the same thing with poetry. Like the point of writing a poem is not the poem. The point of writing the poem is putting it out there and knowing someone else feels something from it. And so for me, that's the ultimate outcome. Um, and so it's easy for me to let the pieces go. That's the point. I want them to land on someone else and have it mean something to them and have them feel something from it. Yes. I actually get really excited thinking about the person that it's going to connect me to. Like my work will yeah. attract the right person because there's a, there's a saying in, in my tribe that, you know, we're all connected. And so I figure, okay, I'm kind of putting like, put this piece out there and I want to see who is attracted to this piece and, and how they're going to come into my life. And I hope they're not just a buyer who take, who buys and leaves. I actually hope that I have a relationship with that person and of some kind, whether it's, you know, um, just a nice to know you acquaintance thing or whatever, but it's really cool to feel that connectedness to somebody and for that your work connected the two of you together. It's just, it's like that, that Chinese, um, there's a saying about the red thread that connects all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's the same kind of idea. And so I used to have a thing called the red thread club when I had a different business. And so I always think about those things. And, um, I love it when I hear somebody else talking about that because I feel like a soul sister thing going on. Definitely. And I, well, I'm, I'm sure that you receive letters from people too, after they get your work. And that is just one of the most astonishing moments for me is when I get a note from someone explaining to me what was happening in their world the moment they received it and opened the package and what it means to them and how it makes them feel that's just mm -hmm. amazing it's an amazing ending to that journey and now it's on to something else with that person yeah and then that's they special. pass it down or hopefully someday. right oh yes oh yes I mean that's one of the biggest things for me you know, graphic design is, is purely ephemera. It is on paper. It is digital, even worse. It's going to disappear. It's going to be in the trash can as soon as, as soon as it's printed. Like right. it is such an ephemeral, you know, thing to do. So you know, turning to metals for me was had a big part of that was turning away from that temporal nature of graphic design and wanting to create things that have permanence that will be dug up out of a hole in the ground 300 years from now or passed down from generation to generation or who knows what. But I just I love that these things will be out there without me someday. And that's really fascinating. And and it's so different than graphic design. You know, it's a business card. Who cares? It's well, meaningless in the grand scheme of things, you know? Just think of that little girl who takes grandma's piece and she's got it in her backpack and she takes it to school and it's your jewelry. Oh. <laughs> That's an awesome thought. <laughs> that would be cool. Um, but you, you asked me for this. I think there was a second half to this question. Is there like what drives me to make these pieces? And I can tell you that it is time um, or lack thereof remaining to me on this planet. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, because I, I came to this art form when I was 45 and um, I just don't have enough time to make everything that I want to make. And um, that just has me on a mission to, to make as much as I can in whatever time that I have left. 
If I were in my 20s, I don't think my work would be anything like this. I think I came to it when I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also makes me sad because I know I just don't have, I don't have enough time. Yeah. I'm doing doing as much as I can. Yeah. But also makes us not, um, what's the word, you know, let time go by without meaning or the days. Like, is this really what I want to do with my day to day when I have such little time left on this earth? So I want to make it meaningful. I want to do the things that make me happy. I want to have passion with what I'm doing. So it really sets your priorities different when you think about that every day is a gift and it might be our last gift. So how do we choose to spend it? So I love that. So my question, I I told you that I was going to ask, um, is how do you find the inspiration and drive for the narrative in your deeply uh, contemplative and sensory evocative work and how do you you know you go to this deep dark place sometimes and how do you keep that from affecting your own energy and getting depressed or um going down that that rabbit hole and would you say your inspiration is always based on the story that you want to tell or is it sometimes based on the technique or the materials or where do you find that happy mix with your work well, I, I figured out that I kind of have developed three sort of methods of, of working and pretty much all of my work falls into one of these three um, uh, methods. So, so the first one is, it's kind of like the same approach that I use when I write poetry. It is the same approach that I use when I write poetry. I, I, when I'm starting a new collection, for example, I will sit quietly and try to tap into a recent experience or a feeling and just sit with it. Um, See if it reveals any deeper meanings to me or if there's some like foothold I can grab onto there that I want to explore and and think about more. Um, And I mean, that's exactly how I write poetry. Just I follow a thread down and, and, if it shows me what it wants to, like, I usually don't know the big picture of what I'm doing until it's done. And then I look back and say, oh, that's what I meant. And that's what the magic is about poetry, you know, because I think most poets think they know what they're writing about. And then they look back on it six months later and they realize oh, that's what it was. That's magical because it's kind of like you're just a conduit. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not making this stuff. You're just delivering these messages. So um so that's kind of like one way that I work and and I I sometimes even begin with a poem so a piece will or a collection will start with a piece of writing and then I will kind of think of all the different ways that I could manifest that in metal whether it's literally including the text or including part of the text and dissolving a part of the text so only part of the story is there um or, you know, just trying to create something that expresses a notion of a story mm-hmm. or makes a little mystery. Um, but really, it's it's that idea of, you know, what have I experienced? And can I write that into a little poem? And can that little poem become the basis of, of a collection? So that's one, one of my methods. Um, another method... <laughs> So this is how I cope with these dark, these dark themes. Um, really, a lot of my work is therapy for me. Um, I, I am not good at um, managing anxiety and, and I do have issues with anxiety and I have struggled with depression. And um, this work is a part of my therapy for that. So I know it seems counterintuitive because it's so dark. Um, but I use this work to help process anxiety or overcome overwhelming emotions. So for example, in um, 2018, uh, I had a lot of scary life events um, happening. I was uh, I had a sick family member and, and I, I had found out that I was also sick. And um, I'm one of those people who just goes right to the worst, to the worst outcome, <laughs> my worst fears. I dwell on them. I get myself all amped up. And um and so that is when I created my collection called Tiny Catastrophes. And um, 
I think you showed one of those pieces. It's there's a car in the snow or the very first it slide. Was the very first there was slide. a collection yeah. of them. Yeah. So um so the that collection showed um I had created enameled existential disasters like tornadoes and asteroids and tsunamis. Um and there was something and this was me reacting to these. I was in such a a state of turmoil. I really had a lot of very significant scary things happening to people I loved and to me. And I just got into my studio and I just let it rip. I just started like, what are the worst things could happen? Go ahead and think about it. Be scared. Think about everything that could kill you. And, um, you know, so I started painting all of these crazy little scenarios and there was something empowering about reducing these end of days scenarios to a little trinket, a little ring. Um, and I wrote little micro poems that some of them were kind of humorous and some of them were kind of serious that I etched on the, the bands of the rings and things like that. Um, and I just reduced those anxieties down to a harmless little jewel. And it literally was putting my fears into perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that whole thing, while it may have looked like I was making jewelry, I was actually, I was actually taking myself through therapy. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so way that's cheaper and effective i think <laughs> that's right that's right I actually made some money on it so hey um but then in 2020 i ended up doing the very same thing obviously during the pandemic a lot of us are trying to figure out how to process all of this craziness and um i was isolating alone through the entire pandemic and um that experience um did not help my anxiety at all and it it was kind of just off and running on its own. And um, I was feeling very concerned about some family members who were at high risk. Um, and I I was very sad about just the, the loss of joy that was everywhere and all the suffering. And then we had the division happening in the country with the politics and the mask wearing and the not mask wearing. and. That was just so overwhelming. So, so my charity collection was born out of that. And the charity collection was a series that depicted flightless and, and dying birds mm -hmm. as an expression of a loss of joy and a call for empathy. Um, yeah, this is one of those pieces. And, um, you know, that was just, and then I started, I learned Chasing and Rose in August. And this is, one of the first pieces that I made with Chasing and Repose. And it was just the perfect therapeutic uh, technique in the studio because yeah. if you're going to learn tap, something, tap, tap, tap. You're, <laughs> yes, that there's that, that rhythmic tapping. And then there's, there's the, all those tiny details get lost in. Um, and then also just the joy of figuring out, can I do this? I don't know. Am I going to, am I going to be good at this? I don't know. So that was really, <laughs> really a uh, fun too, a fun kind of outcome. But, but so the, these are my therapy collections. So what you're seeing is like all of my stuff coming out. Uh, in all of it's these super pieces. crazy that you haven't even been doing that for a year. You're so talented. Oh, uh, well, th thank you. I, I really, really, really love Casey Repose. I can't wait to do more of it. I'm really excited to continue with that. You should. But anyway, so, <laughs> so I use it as Thank you. But I use it as therapy. I use a lot of my work as therapy. Um, and then the third method that I use um, was really the oldest one. This is kind of how I began working is um, when I would get stuck for like what to make. Like I think early on, you don't have a, you don't have your own visual library or dictionary of the visual language that you use in your work. And you don't have enough old work to kind of build on and expand past. Um, so I was kind of at a loss for how to think of ideas. So um, like you have a piece, it's a cuff bracelet stack. There's like a little B and an image on it, I think, or maybe we haven't shown it yet. It's after we... the, maybe it's after the car in the snow. I don't know where it is. Um, Let me go back. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if we showed it. I don't remember if we saw it or not. I don't think I've seen that yet. Okay. Well, we can talk about it when we get to it. Okay. But um, it's a it's a piece that um, the way that I constructed that piece was it started with one element. 
that was just on my bench for a long time. That particular piece, there was a photo in my grandma's photo album that I had found. And um, it was of a man standing in a road and there was no uh, description of who he was on the back. And nobody in my family knew who this person was. So um, we, you know, I just decided to make a story ab about him. So I enameled, it's okay, maybe we didn't include it. I know I it was in the, uh, okay, I know it was in the set that I sent you, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So, so I enameled an image of that man um, who was unidentified and I decided to honor the mystery of his life, I would just write a story about him. And so I wrote this little story about him leaving for war. And I made a three cuff stacking bracelet set. And each cuff was a chapter in his story. And I wrote this whole little story and, and it just helped fuel um, a way to there it is. That's the piece. So each one of those, those pieces is kind of a progression in his story. Um, and the image down there at the bottom, you can see that's an enameled decal on steel. And um, that is just a fellow standing in the middle of the road. I didn't know who he was, so I just made up a story about him. And, and then the bottom cuff has one of my poems about um, loss and longing all the way around it. Um, and the middle one has a letter from written home from the field and there's passport graphics at the top there um so this is like a little three three chapter story of course no one's going to know that but me but it's a way of creating a piece that feels like a little mystery or a story and kind of pulls you in closer and makes you wonder what it, what is the story behind that piece so mm -hmm. that is the way that i started overcoming my creative block was just i'm just going to make up a story about one of these pieces that i'm going to put together and um, that would become my inspiration. And I still do that sometimes. I just don't use it for, for collections. I use it now to like create kind of a show piece. If I'm gonna do a, like a one-off piece, I'll just make up a little story and then that one piece will be that story. I love that. Um, I was telling you about Robert Danzig before we got on and um, he's been to my studio several times to teach and we're good friends. But he had this, he put on a, um, before his class, I invited like 20 different people to my studio to do a slideshow of his work. And he went through this whole elaborate, because he had this a thing for a show that was like a one-off. And it was this elaborate medical device that you wore on your hand. And it had all these mechanical parts. And it was really amazing. And he had this whole story about this doctor, Trebor, and who had made it and all of this. And I used to teach this when I was... Um, teaching artists how to sell their story and um, at the end of the whole conversation like he went on for maybe 30 45 minutes about this story and everyone was just like listening to every word he said and at the end he was like I made it all up Trey Boris Robert spelled backwards and everyone was just like what you know it was like this convincing story that everyone was sucked into how he had made this medical device and how he wore it it was really fascinating how a good story can not only help you create but can pull people in and people buy from the heart not from the mind so if you can engage their heart you can sell your work so i love this if that's how one of your methods that if you just don't have something that's coming you just make it up and you create the story which is tell, says so much about your creativity too so i love that about you but just to switch gears on you now and do something a little bit less I don't know, deep and <laughs> meaningful. <laughs> Let's talk. Um, we had some, we had a question, two questions that were submitted by members that I, I was asked to ask you, and then we'll talk about what's on your bench, and you can tell us a little bit about what you're creating now. So, one of the questions was, um, can your enameling techniques be used with a torch, a butane or map torch, and or a beehive kiln? Because this person doesn't have the finances for a kiln yet. Absolutely. I started out torch firing everything. My entire tiny catastrophe series was torch fired. From underneath. So yes. Yes, from underneath. Um, you have to kind of create a little cage and set it on the little cage and fire from underneath. Um, 
The only challenge is you really can't get very big with those pieces. I found that for map gas or butane, um, I mean, acetylene, you can, you can torch fire a pretty big piece, but with those gases, you really can't get over maybe an inch and a half, I would say. When you start getting into those big, like two inch discs, um, that's pretty tough to do with a torch. I found I just couldn't get enough heat, but a beehive kiln, you could certainly do it. Yeah. Yeah, for Did, sure. Are you also doing a liquid enamel or are you sifting enamels? Um, I sift everything. Although I do like to use um, for counter enamel because I'm super lazy. I hate making blanks. I just hate it. Because <laughs> uh, I just want to get onto the painting, you know, and making the blanks is so tedious. But I use that counter enamel, I think Pam East's counter enamel. Um, and that is a liquid that you, so the back is I, I place that counter enamel that is liquid and then the front I sift. But I, I, there are a lot of enamelists that I really admire who wet pack the first layer, I think. And I don't know anything about that because I've never done cloisonne. So um, I'm taking um, Gilly Byram's class uh -huh. um, in, a, in June. And I am so excited for that is because that wow. Is that yes, the I, arts? Yeah. Yeah, I just couldn't I was so excited that I got a spot in that class. Um she but um amazing. I'm hoping to I know. So I'm hoping to learn how to make nicer base layers from her and maybe maybe I think maybe she wet packs, I'm not sure. But like bring me my battle axe, um, if you know of her. Um, she's an enamelist that I really love and we chat on Instagram and she wet packs, you know, her her first layer. So you know, I think I need to learn how to do that. I know you're not on Facebook much, but you might want to go into the Jewelry Makers Guild group after this and read the comments because I'm sure there will be several enamelists who will be tell giving you some tips about that because we have some really great enamelists in the group. So, a hundred percent. I can't yeah. wait. I, that's why I love doing these because, like, I did a little talk for the Enamelist Society and I learned so much in that because I was I was able to ask all these really smart enamelists. It was like I was presenting, but I was asking them. Like, hey, <laughs> How do you do this? That was great. Loved it. The second question is, uh, do you have any online classes or if you don't teach, do you have someone you recommend, teachers that you rec recommend for either enameling or chasing a repose or any fabrication classes? Hmm. I do not teach only because um, I just don't have the time. You know, I've got two days a week to be at my bench. And, and that's on a good weekend if there's no other obligations that I have to do. So I'm just very protective about my bench time. And um, I've been tempted to teach and I just keep kind of turning it down because I, I'm just selfishly, I just want to stay at the bench and, and create. Um, but let's see, I mean, I learned Chasing and Repose from Liza Nishampkin. She uh, used to, she was a master silversmith, at, um, Tiffany and Company. And uh, she's just done a crazy amount of beautiful chasing and repose. So I was really honored to learn from her. That was at Flux Metal Arts in Cleveland um, where I learned that. But um, she is not teaching though, I don't think. But she is putting little tutorials on her Instagram now. So I would say go follow her. It's Nishampkin Silver Studios is her handle. And I would say go follow her because She's starting to post some IGTV videos and things like that, kind of showing how to use her tools. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a woman, I'll, I'll have to go find her name. I so apologize, I'm terrible with names and I've forgotten now, but I know she's doing some Zoom Chasing and Repose classes. Um, I will get her information and I'll post it in the group. That'd be great. Um, so that you, you can go and find her. Yeah, and great. I do know that there's also, there's also, there's two people. There's also a fellow over in Italy somewhere who's doing Fabrizio. virtual classes. Yes, Fabrizio. Yeah, he's um, my so teacher. He's yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. And I, it, nice. I I thought he was a great teacher. And uh, I had already taken two other teachers, uh, Valentin Yatkoff and Fred Zweig. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so each with each progression of each teacher, I more and more of it like sunk in, you know, oh, yeah this is what I'm supposed to do next or the tool I'm supposed to use or to achieve whatever it is. So I think all three of them are amazing and you couldn't go wrong taking those class from any of them. I think it's just get started and get to know the tools and what they do and, and what your goal is like, you know, the process, there definitely is a process to chasing a repose that you need to follow sort of like enameling, you know, there's a process that you follow in order to get to your goal, but 
Yeah, I don't think there's any bad teachers that I've met that teach it yet that I could say, yeah, go I take mean, my class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, well, gosh, I mean, the people that you've had a chance to learn from, it's, it's crazy, Tanya. Um, but I do want to say that if you feel, you know, like sometimes you just feel like I'm going to be good at that technique. I know I that's my jam. I can tell that's going to be my jam. I would say just get some good tools and and just try it. Because really the biggest thing I learned from the two week or the two day uh, intensive that I took with Liza was how to hold the tool properly so you don't burn out your hands. <laughs> that was a big deal. And um, the dealing with the pitch, I was yeah. terrified I was going to set the pitch on fire. And that's because I had seen these kind of showboat repose dudes like taking their torch to the to the to the pitch and setting it on fire and you know it was just like not something i really wanted to do it seemed like the smoke will be bad to breathe and, <laughs> but you don't you don't do any of that right. like you use a heat gun and you just pop it out and it's it's all fine so i you know try not to be as scared like try to just do it and don't be scared put a little mineral oil on the back of the piece of metal and and that'll help it like pop off and just it's just tinker because most of, of, I think, I don't Tani, you might disagree, but I think most of what I, I have found with Chasing Repose is just you start making marks and you learn how the metal moves and you just learn from that and you're off and running. Yeah. It's not, it's not that technically difficult. I think it's whether you kind of have a penchant for it is the question. Yeah. You know, whether you enjoy it. Like I tell a lot of people. Yeah. You know, you, you have to know if you have the right personality for granulation because it requires something that sometimes I often do not have in me to do, <laughs> but I love it. So yeah, it's, it's the same kind of thing. It's very re repetitive and, but you lose yourself in the work, you know, it's very Zen and the tip, tip, tap, 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 which is the hammer is just like, oh, it melts your heart. It's like the to lighting of a torch. So I think whatever mm -hmm. gets you off, you have to figure that out. And that's what you pursue yes. is your technique. So, mm -hmm. well, let's talk a little bit about what's on your bench now. So tell us about these pieces. And when, I, when you're done telling me about the piece, I'll move on to the next one. Um, sure. So, um, well, so what I'm working on now is my next collection. And it is called We Were All Ghosts. And um, this was inspired by an experience that I had a, a few days after my stepson Adam died where it had I'm in Ohio and it had snowed a lot and it was in spring and it snowed a lot and then we had a warm snap and it caused this really really dense fog which we don't often get here uh where I am and you know I was in this kind of lost emotional place and I was grieving so I took a walk in the fog in an old cemetery. Um, and it's one of those beautiful old rolling hills cemeteries with lots of trees and it's quiet. So I just found myself kind of walking there and um, realized that I was surrounded by deer. It was so dense, you couldn't really see or, or hear anything because it was such an opaque mist. And um, I was walking among a herd of deer and I just kind of stopped and stood there and wondered, why don't they see me and why aren't they running? Am I a ghost? Are they ghosts? And so that was a really surreal and profound experience for me. And I came home and I wrote about it. And that is the inspiration for this entire collection. So the collection has um, the pieces that combined uh, etched handwritten text that are little excerpts from what I wrote about the experience. And then I've got ethereal enameled images of trees and figures uh, walking, which this, this piece I sent you was even before I had added, there's a tiny person walking away from the, the camera the next in one. that little, yes, there he yeah. is. Um, so I've got little kind of people um, fading away, walking away, levitating, um, in these kind of misty forests and, and trees. So that's the the next collection that I'm working on. And um, yeah, there, that one's, he's levitating in that one. So I want to stop and just tell 
all the people who watch this that you guys need to get on Instagram and follow her and follow her stories because in her story she shares some snippets of her process of her painting and it's really mesmerizing to watch and so if you're a technique person and you really love to see the technique behind the scenes um, it's really great to get on and watch her stories every day. So I love them. It's a treat for me every night when my husband is watching Aww. TV. I'm watching your stories. So hey, um, that's great. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for watching. I like that. Um, yeah, so like this piece back back there that, that is loaded right now, um, the texture on that back plate is actually texture and sideways. And I left the ragging edge at the bottom to kind of look like atmospheric particles or rain or branches. Um, so I kind of liked turning that sideways. So I was kind of playing with with the text there. And there's a material that I use for mocking up my little compositions like this that we're going to talk about when we get to the tool list. Okay. Um, but but I like combining. So I have like a whole bench full of I've got some enamels and I've got some etched things and I'm just starting now to start to combine them and the pieces are starting to come together. Um, just last weekend, they started to come together, and I'm making bezels and things, and and starting to to finish the collection. So you, have, um, so that's you have lots of pieces in progress at one time. So you're working kind of assembly style, like you're doing lots of enameling at one time, and then you're putting the pieces together. So you're not just working on one piece from start to finish, and then another piece. It's always a mixture of those pieces, correct? Yeah. Well, it's I wouldn't say it's always that way. Sometimes I decide I need to make one piece and finish it because I get stuck not knowing where the whole collection is going to go. And I think, well, I need a hinge pin piece to finish all the way through. Like my um, um, Faraday collection, I had I finished one of those birds all the way through. And then I was like, oh, okay, I know where I'm going. And then I, and then I went ahead with all the rest of them, production line style. But, you know, for this collection, I just had that same realization. And I realized that I was kind of, getting myself stuck and not knowing where to go. So I realized, okay, I have to finish a couple of these and then continue. Cause I had like 20 enamels and no settings done and just a bunch of etched pieces that really weren't connecting to anything. So I had, I, I started getting a little lost there. So I'm, I'm trying to pull those together. So I'll probably finish a couple pieces and then go back into that production mode where, okay, I'm making all the settings, but I get really bored with anything that seems at all like production work. And yeah. so I don't like to be doing all of the setting at one time and all of the finishing. Right. I just, I find myself getting angry about it. And then I feel like that flows into the work and I don't want that energy in my work. So right. I try not to do that, but um, yeah, so it's a mixture. Sometimes I do it that way. And sometimes I stop in the middle of it and finish a few pieces and then continue. So that I don't get bored. But and so then I also have um, a couple of other sort of special pieces that I'm working on that are carryovers from 2020. Um, one of them is um, you showed it a couple screens ago. It's an albatross at sea that was inspired by Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So this is a Chase and Represe piece with a gold arrow piercing its breast. And um, I don't know when it's going to be yet. I think it's going to be a big necklace. Um, but, you know, I've just got, you know, it's like half done. And so I, I really need to get that finished because it's been on my bench for probably four months now. Now, and then is this one of the pieces that I thought it was brilliant that uh, these pieces, some of these Chasing Repose pieces you're having cast. Is this one of the ones that you're having cast also? No, it's a it's a one off. No, this guy's a special one. It's a it's a one off. It's it's bigger than the other pieces. But I did have um I had the originals cast because when I had finished all the chasing repose birds, I assembled them all on a mannequin. And I think you have one of those I we're going to show later, an image of that later. Um, I had this thought that I was like, okay, well, is, am I feeling bold enough to try to enter the saw bell? Does my work even at all apply to the saw bell? if I'm going to enter something, maybe this would be it. So I started thinking this would be a Saul Bell entry, mm -hmm, maybe. For sure. For sure. Um, and so then I thought, well, okay, I'm going to continue chasing more of these, you know, birds and kind of go all the way around, like one of those things kings wear, you know. Um, 
<laughs> but it's still sitting there. So the reason I sent the, the pieces away to have molds made and have them cast was so that I could make a little money for the hours and hours and hours I had spent on the chasing and keep the originals for the Saul Bell piece, hopefully was my plan. Very smart. That feels very ambitious to say that out loud. I haven't told anybody else. I have never said Saul Bell out loud, but um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to up my game and challenge myself a little bit there. So, Love so that's it. the other piece that's, that's in the studio that I'm trying to finish this year. Lovely. Yeah. That's one of my words for the year finish. Cause I like to start mm -hmm. stuff and then I don't know why, but I don't ever, I didn't used to until this year finish stuff. Now I'm like, you have to finish that before you're allowed to move on to the next piece. Right. I mean, I do have like right. a whole drawer right here full of stuff that I'm working on, but you know, it has its moments where it doesn't want to be worked on anymore. It needs to rest. <laughs> that's right. I think that's completely true. And sometimes you need to rest. Yeah. But I love that you're going to enter that. I'm cheering you on, cheering you on. Oh, well, thanks. Let's hope I actually get it finished. And <laughs> I think they delayed it this year. So that buys me more time. I think it's. Oh, that's good. I think I heard that it's not happening until 2022. So. Oh, wow. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. So my next question for you is a two-parter. And I'm wondering what you do daily. Well, on the days that you're in your studio to prepare yourself for a creative day. And what does your perfect studio day look like? So my mornings are usually coffee and writing, and that is how I get myself out of the business world I've been swimming in all week and into a deeper headspace and a more emotional place. And um, oftentimes I write some poetry, you know, or if poetry is not coming to me, I'll read poetry aloud. And that almost always just puts me into this special place that it, I don't know what it is, but it vibes with what I'm trying to do in the studio. Um, so that's kind of how I kind of prime the gears a little bit to get myself in the right mind set. And then, but, and then when I get in the studio, the first thing I do is I turn on music and music is always playing in my studio. It's a huge part of the atmosphere in here that that's kind of sacred to me. I have a Spotify playlist that's like three days long. <laughs> I just let it go. I always think um, that people, artists should share their playlists because I, I don't know. I think that's intriguing to know what they listen to and what drives their, their emotions while they're working. I do have a Spotify playlist and it's on my Instagram, the link on my bio on my Instagram. If I'm anybody wants to out. go find it. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you're interested in Icelandic compositional ambient music, you will really like it. If not, you will really not like it because that's <laughs> all it is. Um, but yeah, so, um, so the, the music is really a big part of it, um, you know, for kind of getting myself in the mood and in the, in the mindset. And then the perfect studio day is one of those rare days when I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. I'm just in that pure state of creative flow. And it feels like the work or the ideas are being telegraphed from somewhere else and just moving through me. And um, when I'm done, this is my favorite, favorite thing. On those days when I'm done, there's suddenly a finished piece on my bench, you know, and there's that sensation of like a stranger came in and sat this here, you know, um, that's magical to me. And I, I kind of find myself ch chasing that, that feeling and it's elusive. I think it comes maybe one in every 10, 10 sessions in the studio, but it's, it's just magical. Um, it's really a perfect day for me when that happens, but it doesn't happen often. That's beautiful. I wish mine was beautiful like that. Mine is more like the Rockies running up the steps and then he's like, yeah. <laughs> 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 that sounds good too. That sounds great. Um, tell us a little bit about your studio and it, your favorite parts about besides your fur love, which you haven't mentioned very much, but all the parts. Oh, well, that's because if I say his name, he'll I come know. over and ask for a treat. We'll so I'm trying to end. just let him. <laughs> 
he's napping. We'll just let him nap. <laughs> and we're um, for everyone else. We you should know we're invading his playtime with her. So she he is being a really good sport. <laughs> yeah. He hasn't brought me any toys yet. I can't believe I'm surprised. So, um, yeah. So yeah, well, my studio is in my uh, basement of my home. I actually chose this home because of the size of the basement for a studio. Um, that's why I bought this house. Um, I would have preferred an outbuilding or something more like conducive to creativity, but I've done what I could with the space. The area where I have my bench, which is this picture, is actually in an old billiards room. I'm actually sitting in that space now. Um, and so I chose to make the old billiards room like my main studio area. Um, so in this area, I've got everything sort of arranged in a U shape a around me. So everything's kind of close at hand. Like this picture that we're seeing here straight ahead, that's my enameling area where I do my enamel prep and painting and it's also where I do my etching prep um and then to the right that is my bench where I do most of my work yeah there you go and that bench actually was my dad's workbench from his mm. garage wow and um man that's got magic powers like I just feel it's so special to me to have that that bench I mean it's gnarly it's stained and dented and you know um but he made all those marks you know yeah. um and what was cool about it was for some reason he had welded wheels onto it which makes it the perfect height for a jeweler's bench mm -hmm. and I just thought did you do that for me dad that's pretty cool <laughs> but, um but so that's my dad's uh bench it's not ideal because it you know I don't have all the niceties of being able to like pull myself right up into the work, but I've, I've made some hacks to find my way around. There's no catch tray. So I have a little, one of those hospital carts that I bought from Amazon that I have a Tupperware cake pan under it and I just pull it out and, you know, use it when I have to and wheel it away when I don't need it. But, um, so that's my bench. And, um, I do try to surround myself here with a lot of, um, things that inspire me. You know, like there's pictures of people that I love and little objects and things kind of pinned to the wall back there. Um, so that's what those things are. But so that's my bench. And then to the right of that area, there's my soldering station. I don't think I sent you a picture of that, Tanya, but, you know, it just looks so like everybody's one, soldering station. That one? Yeah, that's what's right down there at the bottom. That's my little soldering station. Yeah. So I have a settling that ran out during the pandemic and I just never went got it filled. So. Richard Sally told me, he was like, oh, I'll just use those butane canisters and that's been fine. So it's challenging to get enough heat. Sometimes I'd have to have two of them going and I feel like this is a bad idea. No safety person <laughs> would approve of this, but it gets the job done. This is um, another area of the studio on the other side of the basement. This is where I have two etching stations set up just like this one. Um, I do electro etching and cupric nitrate. So um, that's what this is. And then my sink is in this area as well. And you can see the crazy post-its are my notes for different times and voltage and anodes and cathodes and things like that. That's what those notes are for. Um, this is my, I have a separate area for my kiln. And um, this is the newest area of my studio that I just moved into because as I mentioned, I've been torch firing forever. And so um, the kiln is new. So this is where I set up the kiln. Um, and then I also have areas that I did not send pictures of, Tanya, because they're total disasters <laughs> at all times, which is my shipping and packaging area and my photography area. It's just like a bomb blew up over there and it always looks like that. So <laughs> no pictures of that. That's okay. We can just imagine <laughs> that area. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I also, I do have a corner. So to get around to the fur baby, I do have a full sofa for the dog. And um, I sometimes sit there too, but it's mostly just his sofa that he, he keeps me company while I'm down here. So that's in the corner. Well, he needs that. He deserves it. He does. Yes. He totally deserves it. So speaking of your shipping area, how, what tips um, do you have to share with other artists on how you manage not only having a full-time other job, but managing your business tasks and your marketing and keeping up with Instagram and social media and your packaging and shipping and sourcing? How do you make it all work? Do you have, are you very structured about 
the time that you spend doing each thing? Do you have days that you ship? What would be your some of your tips that you could pass along on how you keep all these balls in the air? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, because I do have that full-time job I, and I only have two days a week to be creative, um, I have to be creative in a different way to try to fit all the mm -hmm. other stuff into yes. my world and my time. So um, I just aim to spend as little time as possible on the business tasks and I try to kind of set it and forget it in a way, um, work smarter, not harder, uh, whatever cliche you want to use. But so the way I kind of do that is um, for my marketing and social, I shoot a lot of video and take a lot of pictures when I'm in the studio making. And I just have that now to where it's like not disruptive and I just do it. Sometimes I just set it up and have it recording, you know, while I'm working and that will give me social content for the following week when I'm out of the studio. Mm -hmm. Um, because I do try to post every single day. Sometimes I can't, but I try. Um, I would have and, never, I would have never guessed that you weren't in the studio every day. Yeah, so I was... know. It's kind of a, dis it's a disappointing illusion. I feel sort of like <laughs> bad about that sometimes because like I had people reach out to me saying, you know, what a dream to make your make a living making jewelry and I just feel so bad having to tell them like well <laughs> I'm paying for classes in metal <laughs> with my jewelry but I'm not paying the bills with it um so anyway but but I do I think it is important um it's just a rule of thumb especially on Instagram to post at least one post a day I enjoy it though I mean for me I really love my Instagram community. Like the folks on Instagram are gracious and kind and creators themselves. And um, I've made a lot of friends on Instagram that I never would have expected. And mm -hmm. I get great feedback about my work on Instagram. So I love sharing my work. So it doesn't feel like a chore. It's kind of like having a big group of people to be like, look what I made. What do you think? And, yeah. you know, I, I just love it. It's so much fun. So it doesn't feel like work to me really to, um, to do the social media side of it. But I do need content because I'm not in the studio during right. the week. So that's how I handle that. Um, and so I guess I would say I spend maybe 45 minutes a day um, creating a post for the next day. Um, and I usually do that in the evening right before bed, which is kind of terrible. <laughs> <laughs> how, how it goes. It's working. <laughs> got to get it done, you know? And then sometimes of course I have, like if I'm having a sale or something coming up, I have to update my website or I have to write blogs or schedule emails or things like that. But, um, the way I handle that is I, I don't want to be selling all the time. I used to just post pieces when I finished them and then I would have to like disrupt everything to pack it and ship it and whatever. And so I changed my model to now where I just make like a 12 to 15 piece collection, sometimes smaller, but like every two or three months. And then I, um, I sell that collection. Usually it sells out in like in the same night and then I'm done. So I do all of the packaging and all of the shipping and the trip to the post office and all the correspondence and all of that in one day. And then mm -hmm. I can just focus on making again for the next two or three months. And that system I'm finding really, I, I really like the way that's working out. Yes. Um, so, and then I'm, you know, because listing the pieces, like everybody hates listing them yeah. because you have to write a description and all that stuff and the pricing and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to be doing that all the time. So I just do it all. Like when the collection is done, then I just get busy. I spend like a whole day just doing all that stuff, photographing, listing, sending the emails, setting the countdown timer on Instagram, and then I can forget about it for another two months. Yeah. So that's kind of my little hack for not having to do it all the time. It's also a really smart marketing move. It's, uh, you know, people buy based on scarcity and mm -hmm. abundance or lack thereof and urgency. So you're creating both of those by doing what I call pop-up sales where you, nobody really knows when it's gonna happen and when it happens, you better get it or you won't get a piece. And it works so well, but it also allows you to work in this production style where you're not every day having to go to the post office or worrying about packaging something up and you can just let it flow. You know, when that collection's done, then you sell it. And it's a really smart way to, to work. So thank you for sharing that. 
and um, your process because I think everyone can take something from each of the artists that I interview and apply it to what works for them best and what they feel like fits their their workflow best or their life best. So um, I also wanted to ask you, but I already think I know this, the answer to this. Um, some artists either love selling their work or they hate it because there's this like they they don't like the salesy part of selling and they don't like the whole writing the description or maybe it's because they don't want to let go of the pieces so how do you feel about selling and what are your like do you do shows are are is would that be something that you would like to do where you get out and meet your buyer or do you prefer to do it through instagram or pop-up sales what what's your your jam <laughs> I've never done a show. My growing up, my mom did a lot of shows and um, I bore witness to how much work that is, the setup and the teardown and, mm. you know, the disheartening moment when somebody says, well, I could make, you could make this Jane. And, you know, it's like all that stuff. I hear these horror stories. So I, I've never done it. It's not because I, I hold anything against it. It looks, it looks like fun to be around a bunch of other makers. Some of the shows are pretty cool looking but um i literally just do not have time i just don't know when in the world i would be able to go and do shows because of my job and my precious two days at the bench right. so for me you know selling on the web and promoting it through instagram is just the lowest hanging fruit it's like the easiest way to do it and um it, it buys me the most time at my bench and Smart. that's what I that's what everything I do is about is just how can I get more time at my bench I use my vacation time from my business mm -hmm. to to really get into something like I'll spend five days on a collection and that that's how I spend my vacation time so um I don't see how I could do shows but um it seems I'm sure there are benefits to it like it'd be fun to have people react in person to my work and get to know buyers but I do that a lot over Instagram yeah too so having never done it, I can't say if, if I would like it or not, I guess, but this is working for me now. So I guess I'll keep doing, and I, I have never had anything in any galleries except the metal museum is the only place where I have pieces in a retail shop. And I just thought that was such a great opportunity. I would be foolish to, to not do that, but it's very hard for me to give up half yeah. of a sale when I know I can sell it myself on my website. But I, I realized that there are some soft benefits to that that are not about money. Right. It's more about, you know, getting in front of collectors and serious buyers and things. So, but I'm a newbie in that gallery territory. That's kind of where I'm moving next, or I'm trying to explore, you know, what I should be doing next exhibitions and galleries. Yeah. I hope. I think that's, yeah, I think it's a good move for you. Yeah. I'm going to be doing my first ever show in June, end of June. I've done lots of trade shows. I built my whole business doing trade shows, but that was schlepping 3,000 pounds of pliers and hammers and all sorts of tools. And those are easy because I have a passion for tools. And as you will see in the next section, um, that I like to share those things. So this will be different for me. I've been to a lot of shows though, so I know what a good booth looks like and how you know, to do it. And I like selling. So I'll let you know how it goes, but we'll see. It's very expensive. I'm having to invest in a new everything, you know, the tent and the display cases, and I had no idea what it cost. So even if I have an, an amazing show, I'm going to be in the hole. Afterwards. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes that's how we roll around and, here. And I'm hoping it's because I will meet and be connected to the right people who then we'll have other opportunities. So I'm putting myself out there and welcoming the universe to to bring that to me in exchange for what I'm bringing. So we'll see how it goes and I'll report back. But That's thrill. Wait, when is it? It's the end of June. It's called The Art of the Cowgirl and it's um, in Montana and it's all uh, women who are cowgirls that um, do very have very very expensive horses and do amazing things with their horses and dogs they have a dog event also a cow dog event so wow. i think it's going to be fun my best friend is coming and she's going to help me work the booth and my husband will probably be there it'll just be an adventure so what else 
can you do on a nice summer weekend in Montana? That so. does, it sounds like fun, I have to say. It does yeah. sound like a lot of fun, especially with your bestie there. Yes, it should be a blast. And mm -hmm. I, you know, it'll, I'll probably end up buying something I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> some cow boots or something cowgirl boots mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so the next section um is my one of my favorite parts because every single artist that i interview loves a different tool for a different reason so it's always fun to see what their secret ingredients are to the techniques that they do so um in david letterman style we start with your 10th favorite tool and for you that was the gr well if my slideshow will work the GRS engraving block shelf. And do you use this for, like I sometimes use it for my soldering station or my engraving station. What are you using it for repose to hold your bowl? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I bought it. Well, I bought it when I got my first engraving block, which was just last year. That was a big, exciting purchase for me. I finally got like a really nice engraving block. Um, and I bought it thinking, well, that just makes sense. I'm gonna need that. So I just bought it at the same time. But what I actually end up using it for mostly, um, I do use it with the engraving block, but I use it for chasing a repose. And that thing is so sturdy. You wouldn't believe you could have this like big, heavy pitch, iron pitch pot on there um, and hammer on it. But man, that thing is strong. And um, it's perfect because it allows you to be, have your arms at the right height and you're, you're not hunched over, you're not up like this. So um, I really enjoy it for that. That's what I use it for. Yes. And it just, it you know, for those who aren't familiar, it just slides right on your GRS Benchmate system. You take the bench pin off and you stick that on and you're good to go. So I love that thing. I love it for so many things. It's, it's a great little platform for all sorts of different um, things that you do at your, that you need to adjust the height or have a shelf. That's interesting. I love it. Your number nine is one of my favorite tools, um, the Fordham fish mouth with the shield. And I'm assuming you use that for polishing. Yeah, so I don't do a ton of polishing, but I I do a lot of sanding and I use those um, silicone wheels to finish um, bezels, seams and things like that. And for me, I have um, a lung condition and I have to be super, super careful in my studio. I almost had to give up my studio because of this. And I decided, no, you know what? I'm just going to invest in a ton of safety equipment instead. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what is amazing about this, if for people who haven't used it, is like after a month, man, the bottom of that shield is just bobbed up with all kinds of terrible things you would have been breathing. Yeah. So I still use a respirator when I use this. I don't go, I don't go solo without a respirator. But um, I just feel that it does a great job of kind of directing the particulates away from my face so that's why I really like it do you but I don't do a ton of polishing I really don't I do mostly hand finishing but it, cleanup is really what I use it for mostly do you have it hooked up to a vac I have it hooked up to the Fordham dust collection system me too I really like moment. that yeah yeah it's a good it's I do a too really I wish it were more quieter yeah they're it's all like loud it, though I mean even they are the jewel to I have the jewel tool one in Montana and it's louder than the Fordham oh Bummer. So they're all about the same. And I've researched out Quattro. They're all about the same decimal decibels. Um, I like this one because you can, if something gets sucked in, which I've, I could sometimes <laughs> I'll unhook it and use it with my Kate Wolf sand belt sander. And sometimes a piece will go pew and sucked in and you can just get it out so easily. You don't have to take apart the back and the filter and yeah, it's very handy. Yeah, it has this clear cylinder so that, you know, collects all the sweeps and stuff. So that's kind of neat, too. OK, so this is the tool that you are alluding to that I have never used. And I want to know what you use it for, which is the Quake Hold. <laughs> this is the most ridiculous tool. It's not even a tool, but I love this stuff. So it's it's made for people, as I understand it, basically in earthquake zones to secure things that sometimes tend to rumble off the shelves. Um, but what I use it for, it's basically kind of a mildly tacky putty and I use it to hold my enamels onto like a little wooden disc when I'm painting on them. Oh yeah. I also, I also use it for positioning, um, elements of a piece before I commit to a design. I can move the enamel from this side to that side, or just kind of move elements around. So all of those 
images you were showing of the work that I, saw I have on my there. bench currently. Yes. That, yes. So that, that's, there was so much quake hold on there. Yes. I saw the little gray dots. <laughs> I'm like, what is that? that? That is the quake hold. So, um, so I just, use it for and you can position things for photography with it nice um you know it's just a, a great little weird thing that i use all over the place in my studio so i highly recommend it i think i'd like <laughs> to get some of that because i use kate wolf sticky wax everywhere but it like oh, leaves yeah. residue and you know mm -hmm. on things that you don't want it to like i've unfortunately used it on my walls and i can't get it off the walls so i wax on yeah. my walls so I, I know, I know that the quake hold will leave a stain on an absorbent, on an absorbent material. If you leave it long enough, it's okay. not like that blue stick stuff. Yes. I know a lot of people use blue stick for the same purpose. And that might be better if you're worried about stains, because there is like a little bit of oil that wicks out okay. of the quake hold in time. Um, I haven't had it be a problem, but it depends on how you plan to use it. But you might like the blue stick stuff because then you can use it on your walls and it won't won't leave a mark, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, there's a, a, a really well-known um, artist who has this amazing plantation house and all everything in it is an old antique, like really old, beautiful things. And everything is glued down with that stuff so that when they clean it, they don't knock and break oh. things. Not so you don't take it but so that it doesn't get broken and it's really smart, mm -hmm. but then you go to move something on the nightstand and it doesn't move. It's right there. It's going to stay there. So that's funny. another use. If you're wondering, there you, if go. you don't want things broken. Um, your number mm -hmm. seven uh, is the three M wet dry polishing paper. And I love those too. But how do you like to hold this? Like, do you wrap it around something or do you just put it in your hands and use it? I fold it up like four times into a little pad. I make it into a little pad and I, most of my finishing I do by hand. So, um, this is kind of my final finish is the 600 grit gray sheet. And, you know, I just kind of like give it a little, little rub. Sometimes I go in little circles, but it just leaves a nice sort of soft sheen mm -hmm. of a, of a finish. And I like to use that to remove patination around my text so that I etch. It's perfect for that because when you fold it like four times, it has like a nice um, stiffness to it. So it doesn't go down into the text. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, whereas if you were using one of those like little scotch bright wheels, yeah, it, it would just it. zip that, it would zip it right out. So I like to use this by hand on my etching to remove the, the patina. Are you patinating um, so with that's a like. liver of sulfur or are you something else? No, I'm a black max girl. I oh, use nice. I use Midas Black Max because it takes less time and I'm very impatient with everything. Yeah. So me too. Um I I really like black max. I really do. Yeah. Do you put it in a little watercolor pen uh, brush? You just use no, it. No, I I I have a wide mouth mason jar, like a short wide mouth mm -hmm. mason jar. And I have plastic um, uh, tweezers and I just throw it in, pull it out, brass brush it. Yeah, I usually dip it. Now, if I'm doing my text on a bezel, I use a tiny little brush because I just don't want to, sometimes I just don't want all that patination and I just want the lettering to be black. Mm -hmm. um, then, I, then sometimes I'll just use a brush and brush it in, in these like tiny little spots. I do that too, occasionally. I'll have to post in the group, I found these uh, amazing little, I don't know, they're like sponge applicators that work better than brushes. For And they get into little tiny grooves and they hold the stuff and don't drip mm. it like a brush will run. So sometimes you get stuff spreading and this will, so I'll share it with the group because I'm amazed at how, I got them on Amazon. They're just cheap and they work especially well. And then you can toss them because they're so inexpensive and you don't have to worry about the chemicals or, you know, on washing your brush out and stuff. So anyway, I diverge. So number six is your- I love your tips. Everybody <laughs> wants your tips, Tanya, never stop. I am like a, just a weirdo. <laughs> no, you're a, tip, you're a tip machine. It's great, keep going. Your number six is the Green Line Saw, which I love. I have one, I love it. It's a great, don't you just love the way, it's just easy to load, it's good in your hand, it's got a great balance. It just, I wish sometimes they made a bigger one, like deeper. 
Yeah, I I thought that they had some limited edition deeper ones, but mm. I might have imagined that or dreamed it. I'm not <laughs> sure, but that would be nice. Um, I I really do like this saw. I'm not the greatest at sawing. Um, and this I've I've had the um, oh what's the brand that's the kind of the ugly. I hate to say that, but it's like a very manly saw. That, this one, that guy, new, yes, new concepts, new concepts. Yeah, so I have a new concept, and um, I have just the regular German, you know, mm -hmm. saw frame, and um, I love the Green Lions balance. Like, there's something about the way I hold the saw that it, it wants to just wobble and snap that blade. And that weight on the back of the new concepts and the German saw was just hard for me to sort of manage. And then, and I just thought well, I was destined to be bad at sawing. And then I, I thought, <laughs> well, I'll just try the Green Lion. Everybody talks about it, and it 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 just changed everything for me. I'm so much better at sawing with this saw. Yeah. It, and look at it. I mean, it's a beauty. It's it like is. so cool to have it on your bench. You know, it looks like some medieval war tool you know it's <laughs> really cool you could put a sharp <laughs> blade in there and have a, a sickle or something i don't know what oh, they're yeah. called some kind of totally. war, war tool your number yeah. five is i think everyone's must have which is the 3m radial discs but i will say mm -hmm. that i um was given some of these to try which is the dedeco um but they don't you only buy one you don't have to buy three to six to put on they're oh, like stiffer cool and I use both. So these are amazing because they will remove scratches at a 3M. You know how when you use a 3M and you think it's an 80 grit, but it acts more like a 300 grit, it doesn't really remove. These will actually get in and polish areas better and stiffer. So I will use, like if I want the, the softer polish to get into all the little grooves, I'll use the 3M ones. But these are like my new thing, my new jam. I love mm. these. Um, and I got them from Pepe Tools. David gave me a, some to try. And I rarely get free tools, but I was really happy to get these because I think they work amazing, um, not in replacement of, but with the 3M. And um, mm. uh, I heard somebody say that they thought they scratched the work but I think it's just because they're not used to actually how it removes material versus like the 3M doesn't really. And mm -hmm. um, so I tested them on metal to see like, does the yellow compare to the yellow and so on. So um, I really happily endorse these. I think they're really great. So if you're ever looking to try something different that could go along with the 3M wheels, these are really exceptional. What is the exact product name? Uh, it's Dedeco. It's D E D E C O, and then mm -hmm. um, I think they're just called sundials, but they're uh, oh sundials. Okay, yeah, I'll post it in the group. But they only have one. You don't layer them. So when it's done, that's it's nice. Done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, and you put the word up. You know the Dedeco faces up so that they're going the right direction. Where three M you face them down so they go the right direction. So mm -hmm. but they use them the same way and they're the same exact colors. The green is the same as the green and so on but it's more oh. of a more realistic grit to use than like you know when i see somebody using the 80 yellow it's not really 80 but these you're getting really well, close to being 80. i'm very happy to hear you say that because that's my one gripe about these 3m yeah is that they're they're not quite aggressive enough even the most aggressive of them but the reason that i use them is because when I have fire stain on an etched piece and I etch just about everything, um, I cannot just go after it with the sanding disc mm -hmm. because I'll remove the etch. So um, these are, are really good for removing light fire stain from something that's etched that you have to be careful about not, um, you know, um, in, that you would be in danger of kind of sanding away. Right. Um, so that's why I like them for. When I don't polish them all the way up, I never go all the way up the steps. I never bought the kit because I knew I was never going to, I never do anything up to a high polish. So um, I usually stop at the pretty low grits and then I hand finish with that like 600 grit right. uh, gray, gray paper. Um, but I, I'm interested to try these other ones because it sounds like they're a little more aggressive and that's what I need. Because if you got a real 
deep piece of fire stain, these take a long time. <laughs> yes. But there's no choice for you because you've etched it and it's almost finished and here you are. Yes. But um, that other product sounds like it might be a better fit. And I know they sell the ones that are thin, like the 3M, but don't get those. So the do I haven't tried okay. those. I can't endorse those. But these are the ones that are okay. the single. And I'll just post a little link to the number so people can order the right ones. But I, I love them. I use them every day. Fabulous. So That's exciting. The next one, um, your number four, is your Dodeco silicone polishing wheel. And I... When I looked at that, I thought it was a Mizzy wheel, but it's not. It's a different kind of wheel, and I haven't. I don't think I've tried these. So what's what yeah, so stage do you use? Well, I'm not going to. Yeah, so I'm not going to say that I'm a professional about these. So a friend of mine, uh, G. E. Smith, he's a metalsmith here in the Cleveland area. He, I was telling him, we like to talk shop from time to time. We just get on the phone and we just talk about tools, and it's really fun. And um, you know, I was complaining about the difficulty I was having cleaning up solder. And he said, I'll oh, just get these silicone wheels. It's just because I'm mostly it's an issue for bezels with me. I said, Oh yeah, it takes that seam right down. And, you know, so I, I purchased these and I'll never go back to any other. I don't even remember how I was doing it before, <laughs> but these are so great. You know, it, it's quick work of it. it. It's clean. You can control it. Um, you know, you don't accidentally take it down too far or put a dent in, in the piece, you know, when you're working at. So I love these. Um, but I, I do think this is the right product, but I ordered, I'm one of those people I just am like, these all look good. So I order five different silicone wheels that are mm -hmm. who knows what green color from Rio. And then I just start trying them. Um, but I think it's the gray one is the one that I use most often. I don't know what that means. I don't know what grit it is, but if you buy that one, <laughs> It'll work for you. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I know, that. very helpful. Aren't you just so glad you invited me on? I am. I'm so I helpful. I'm really glad. <laughs> now you can say her name because I would butcher it. So this is—is uh, is it Liza? Is that her first name? Or... Liza Nishampkin. Nishampkin. It's her chasing mm -hmm. and repose tools, and I know that she sells these. And then you can get them at a Rio, also, maybe. And uh, auto fry, I awesome. believe. Great. Yeah. So if anybody, yeah. and they're very but, expensive. So you guys know that you get a code with me. So if you want to save seven percent at auto fry, just let me know, and I'll share my code anytime on any order. You just have to spend a hundred dollars. Oh, and then yeah, also so it's her hammer and the. Uh, I forgot that there's three photos here: the hammer and also mm -hmm. the uh, pitch. Yeah. So I took a, a two day. Uh, weekend intensive with Liza here in Cleveland at Flux and um, <laughs> at the end of the weekend I bought every tool she had brought with her I <laughs> like bought out I even think I bought a tool that she, was hers that wasn't for sale <laughs> um, because I I just had a feeling it was going to be something I was going to want to do um, and her you know she had us using her tools in the workshop of course and um, the, you know, the, the hammer has a nice wide face, which makes it easier for a beginner. It's very nice. And it's got this pistol grip uh, handle that is really lightweight and really thin, but it's got a big fat end on it so that it fits in your palm really nice. And whatever happens to make steel bouncy, I don't even understand what goes into this, but that hammer almost feels like it's spring loaded, you know, so when you're tapping, it just bounces itself back off of the tool and um, you get in that sweet spot, man, that's really cool. So this, this hammer just kind of does some of the work for you. It saves your hands a little bit. And then I like her pitch because she has pitch bowls pre-filled and I didn't want to have to like melt a bunch of pitch in my oven. Uh, <laughs> and so I actually bought an iron pitch pot from her pre-filled. It wasn't nice. this like, you know, pan and, um, and that is what I, I use. And I have her green pitch, which I also really like because it doesn't stink. It kind of smells like pine trees, which is nice. Isn't that one a little bit more brittle, though? Like it can it let go I, a little faster than the black? It, I don't know. It might, again, like remember, I just learned this in August. So I have never used any other pitch uh, except hers. I know she calls it, I think, medium body. And for me, what I kind of like is like, I'm not doing real deep work. So, um, you know, usually by the time the 
corners kind of start lifting and cracking in the pitch, mm -hmm. I'm ready to anneal anyway. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I haven't, um, and I don't know the nuances of different kinds of pitch. I think her green pitch is considered kind of a medium density, if that's a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm saying that right. And so it kind of felt like that was a good choice for me because it was a versatile and I didn't really know what kind of stuff I was going to be doing. I, I'm not making vessels and things and right. I'm not, you know, doing real deep three-dimensional objects. I'm just doing really subtle bass relief kind of work. So it works for me, but, but I, I don't know if she has multi, she may have other kinds of pitch too, that she offers that have different properties. Yeah. There's so, I love there's her so many things. There was a, a metalworks is having their symposium right now. And yesterday there was a, a gentleman on who is a chasing a represent artist who makes amazing things that I can't even wrap my head around. And he showed his whole process. And it's funny how everyone, like I never knew about, uh, the mineral oil on the back till mm -hmm. you said that mm -hmm. because I learned from two traditionalists who are from, you know, Italy and Bulgaria who do it with a torch and it's done a certain way. So you can always learn something from somebody else just by talking to them about their tools that they use or about their process, because there's always a shortcut just because it was like the pure way to do it. Like in, you know, some enamelists, their pure ways are like, Oh my God, I could never do that. I'm just like a want to be a kamikaze anamalist instead of a right. artist. So um, yeah. it's, it's really nice to just to chat about those things. Your number two is your MegaView Pro magnifier headset. So mm -hmm. you like this better than other vision things that you've tried? I do. You know, I started out with one of those big, like Frankenstein-y, uh -huh. big Optimizer. heavy things. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I'm really sensitive as it turns out to having weight on my forehead and it gave me a headache. I also didn't like that it sort of obscured my side vision mm -hmm. and I'm super clumsy. And so I, I just hated not being able to tell if I had set a fire somewhere that I couldn't <laughs> see. So, um, so I switched to this because it's open. And so you can see it's, it's a very nice wide open. The one I have actually does not have this light in it which would be nice, but they didn't have those when I bought mine. Mine's just plain. So it actually is a little lighter than this one, I'm sure. Um, but I just appreciate that it, you know, you don't feel you have a big thing on your head and um, it doesn't give me headaches either. So it's more comfortable for me. So I, I like this, this um, magnifier a lot. And your number one is your precision 12 inch bench shear. And I've never met anybody who's tried this one. So it's nice to see that. I got this on sale on Rio. Can you believe it? Rio had a sale, first of all, and I nabbed this piece. I was really excited. Um, but I bought it because I was, um, at the time I had a production line of customizable cuff bracelets that I was doing. And I just needed a way to cut a whole bunch of metal fast. And, um, you know, I was really just starting out and this was, it felt like an awful lot of money. I think it was maybe 450 or something like that <laughs> and uh, i know we laugh because it's like oh just wait this is just a gate this is just a gateway tool yeah. you know um but uh but it was a terrific investment because it saved me so much sawing time yeah well, but then now that i've got it i use it for everything i just take a little nip off of an end or i cut a little bezel back or a lot of my work is sort of um you know has like a square angle to it here and there and so it's like great for cutting those great for cutting ring shanks it cuts up to 16 gauge i have don't tell anybody cut 14 gauge on this before and it worked um i wouldn't recommend it but i have done it um and because uh, i was in a real big hurry i was just hoping i wasn't ruining this this thing but um but it's really great if you can if you can invest in it i just think if you're ever sawing straight things buy one of these because you're done in two seconds. It's yeah. just the greatest thing. And you know, what's cool about this too. I don't know how they manage it, but it's kind of like a guillotine shear without the price of a guillotine. It's not as great as a guillotine shear, but it doesn't curl the metal. Yeah. I don't know how they've done this, but the metal it's sometimes if you're, if you're cutting a very narrow piece of a very, thin gauge it can twist a little mm -hmm. but you know you can just you can just fix that 
Um, and, and, but I know that those kind of ones that you bolt to your bench and you yep. pull the big arm down, those curl the metal pretty badly. Mm -hmm. This, for some reason, this, this sub uh, bench here does not do that. So I really got lucky buying this because I didn't know that about it when I bought it, but it, it's a great, it's a great tool. I really like it. Now tell us about your bonus. I have a bonus tool. <laughs> If you haven't gathered, I'm a little clumsy in the studio and I'm always burning myself somewhere on my torch tip or um, cutting into my fingertips. And um, what I like about these is that they will stay on in the studio all day. Even when you're doing all your crazy stuff, they don't fall off. And most importantly, they come in black, which I appreciate because they kind of look cool <laughs> on Instagram. So that's my, that is my bonus tool. I like it. I like it. <laughs> okay. So I want to thank you so much for all of your time. And of course I live for your story. So I'm going to be watching to see what you're creating. And, but now the bubbles kind of burst that you're, I'm like, Oh, she didn't make that today, but maybe this weekend. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, and so I want to encourage everybody, please check out her social media pages. It's really important that you always you know, if you can, if you can spend two minutes to like, comment, and save on a post, that really helps out every artist, boost their what's shown to everybody else. If you go to YouTube to subscribe and hit the like button and leave a comment, that's also very encouraging. Um, I'm also going to encourage you to post any comments that you want in both the YouTube uh, channel because she'll I'll see those and if there's something important I'll alert her to your comment and also onto the Facebook group but that will be go that post will be gone after tomorrow so um those comments won't live on but the ones on YouTube will so please go over there and post there and then um if you have any questions about her contact information I will repost it there as well and it'll be on the YouTube channel and um I just want to let you guys know, thank you so much for supporting me and for supporting other artists that have been my guests on the Jewelry Makers Guild podcast. I really love doing them. I won't be having another one until July. I'm taking a break just because I'm moving and then I'm getting ready for, the sh for my first show. So um, I will let you know who is the uh, next guest in a couple of, you know, in probably a couple months. I'll be announcing who the next guest is for July. So if you want, you can go back and listen to the old ones. There have been now 13 which is a really great number to pause on and um, if you're in Montana I'm going to be having my first show at the end of June and would love to meet you in person um, and if not maybe next year when you're in Tucson at the Tucson gym show so um, anyway I'm just really grateful that you uh, said yes I didn't know if you would say yes to being interviewed I'm like oh, I, I follow her I need to know about her. So <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And please give your fur baby an extra hug for sharing us with, sharing you with us. Uh, when I, know I will do that. that fur baby <laughs> needed the love. So. Well, thank you, Tani. It really was just an, a, such an honor for me to be here. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, I will say good night. Have a good evening. And uh, I look forward to your weekend creations. Okay, you guys, I'll talk to you later. Have a great day.